Hello, greetings from the Climate and Clean Air Coalition Secretariat. Uh, thank you to everybody for joining today's webinar on country actions to reduce short-lived climate pollutants. We are very pleased to have you here today. In this webinar, representatives from, the, from governments will present the outcomes of their CCAC-supported work, and the speakers will highlight uh, their country's motivation to address short-lived climate pollutants and how they have used integrated climate and clean air quality plans to enhance their climate ambition. So we very much uh, welcome you, and I would like to provide you with a brief overview of the agenda for today. I will be facilitating today's session. My name is Catalina Echeverri. I work with the CCAC Secretariat as a coordinator working on country engagement and governance support. We will be hearing today from Nigeria, represented by Asmao Jibril and Bala Bapa from the Federal Ministry of Environment of Nigeria. We will also learn from Colombia's experience with the participation of John Henry Melo from the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development. And this will then be followed by a panel, dis uh, a panel discussion with our distinguished guest, Jonathan Banks from Clean Air Task Force, Stephen Hammer from the World Bank, and Philippe Brunet from Switzerland. We would just like to go through uh, some instructions with regards to the WebEx platform. We uh, encourage participants to enter their questions through the Q and A function that you can see uh, if you scroll down to the bottom of your of your uh, platform screen, you'll find three dots, a symbol with three dots. If you press that, you'll be able to access your uh, Q and A function for the event. Hopefully, you can choose to ask and select all panelists, or you can. Uh, select a particular panelist that you'd like to uh, extend a question to. Yes. Oh, finally. We, uh, we also request that you remain muted while other speakers are participating. Uh, and you can also raise your hand if you would like to interject with a question to any of the panelists. Uh, that function is also readily available. Um, if you if you hover over your name, you will be able to see it. Hopefully, as I'm sorry, if you go to the bottom of your screen, there's a raise the hand function next to the reactions, and there that would permit you to raise your hand. So, next, please. So, without further delay, I would like to introduce you to Romina Piccolotti. Uh, she is senior policy analyst for the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development, and she will be providing opening remarks. Welcome, Romina. Over to you, please. If you could please unmute yourself, Romina. Romina, we're still unable to hear you. If you could please unmute and if comfortable, if you could also please put on your camera. We seem to be having an issue with the mute button. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you, Romina. Okay, and I my camera is on, so I'm not sure um, why you cannot see me. Can you see me now? No, we're still unable to see you, but I think you can proceed. Okay. Thank so, uh, okay, let, let me try this again. I'm sorry you cannot see me. I have been having some troubles this morning um, with the tech but happy to be here. So um, what is this webinar about? So we're celebrating the 10 year anniversary of the CCC. Um, many of us in this webinar has been at the beginning of the CCC. So I'm um, glad that you have accompanied this institution for 10 years. And we're as part of this webinar is recognizing the hard work 
that partners and specifically countries have put in uh, towards the commitments of reducing short life climate pollutants. And since its inception, the CCC uh, has done amazing work and um, this institution will not be possible really uh, without the partners' actions. So uh, if you remember, the CCC started with six countries in a parking lot and um, its formation was in uh, 2012 and now it's comprised of 73 states partners and 78 non-state partners, including inter intergovernmental organizations as well as uh, NGOs. So um, the CCC, as you know, is the only multilateral international initiative that work on the emergency plan that we need to put together to tackle the climate emergency. All the scientific reports are um, in agreement that without short life climate pollutants reductions, we are not going to take advantage of the 10 window of opportunity that we do have to remain under 1.5. So uh, this is the emergency plan and I'm so glad to be part of this coalition. I'm sure uh, you are too. Um, basically, if we if you care about the climate emergency, you need to do, be doing significant reductions of short life climate pollutants. There is no other way. Um, so, as you know, um, short life climate pollutants include reductions of methane, black carbon, HFCs, and tropospheric ozone. Uh, why working on short life climate pollutants? Well, I just said, it's the only way to remain under 1.5. It's also um, a wise development decision because um, it helps clean your air, it helps uh, reduce the loss of your crops, uh, it, it helps increase your energy efficiency. So um, it's an agenda that goes high by hand with the development agenda. It can also avoid up to 0 0.6 degrees of global warming by 2050, which is essential. Um, as I say, um, it cleans your air and by doing so, um, reduce uh, air pollution, will, which will prevent 3 million of premature death and as well uh, reduce uh, crop losses up to uh, 50 million tons per year. Um, we can do this, we can do, reduce what science tells us we must reduce in the next decades of short and climate pollutants. We have proven solutions. Um, we have available technologies, and in most of the cases, it makes an uh, economic uh, wise decision as well because it's uh, minimum cost or, or not cost to do so. And obviously, um, to have an unstable climate system override any other cost that we can think of. So um, the solutions that we have today at the table can help cut methane emissions by at least 40%. Many of the partners of the CCC are also partner now of the Global Methane Pledge. And uh, uh, there's a specific commitment of reductions under the Global Methane Pledge and the CCC obviously can play a key role in helping countries uh, achieve that commitment. And at the same time, um, the CCC partners have agreed that methane should be the flagship of the CCC this year. So um, get ready because you're going to see a lot of action on methane um, thanks to the CCC. Uh, on black carbon, um, the, we can cut at least 70% of black carbon by 2030 and virtually eliminating uh, HFCs, 99.5% um, of HFCs by 2050. Uh, all of these obviously compare to 2010 levels, which is the same level that the Global Methane Pledge used. Um, so what are the CCC IC achievements uh, up to today? Well, I will say one of the main achievement of the CCC is, um, has been the Kigali Amendment, which is the only mandatory agreement today um, accepted by the global community that reduces a super greenhouse house with specific targets 
and, um, and a specific timeline. Without the CCC, we will not have that agreement today. The CCC play a, play a key role at the ministerial level, uh, bringing together um, ministers from the CCC that um, came to the negotiations of the Montreal Protocol, uh, meet um, back to back. The CCC held a specific meeting back to back and form a specific coalition of uh, high political will um, that were promoting the Kigali Amendment, basically. And the CCC also played a key role by uh, funding and launching the first inventories of HFCs that um, then the multilateral fund of the CC of the Montreal Pro Protocol decided to take over. Uh, they also, the CCC play a key role there, uh, putting together projects on the ground that um, support countries to see the way through a better alternative that HFC is in different sectors. So um, building the trust that the work could be done at the national level, which is essential for international commitments. Um, the CCC also play a key role on ensuring that the IPCC recognize the value of shoreline climate forcers. Uh, and as you have seen in the latest reports, uh, there's a predominant role of uh, shoreline climate forcers, as I said, to tackle the climate emergency. It's a recognition of the role in the IPCC reports. And this was done uh, thanks to the great science that the CCC put out there, but also through our partners representative uh, at the IPCC meetings as well. Um, also, the CCC um, put together a global methane assessment, which is the first of its kind in the world uh, through our scientific advisory panel. And it was the foundation and the base for uh, the global methane pledge and as well, that now has 111 countries um, signed that pledge. And also uh, it was instrumental for many countries to undertake their own national actions or plans of reductions on, on methane. And again, I think this will be a great year for the CCC on, on supporting countries on, on that. Um, so I, I, I will stop there. Um, and my, my last word is that first of thanks to all the partners of the CCC for taking this seriously and, and moving forward, uh, removing obstacles on the ground uh, to make sure that we are taking the actions and that we're increasing our ambitions on these actions. And um, also to the donors of the CCC, thank you, because uh, the trust fund is a very important tool to provide capacity building and technical support to countries. Um, so without um, further ado, I will um, ask please if the partners can go ahead, um, sorry, the speaking today can go ahead and introduce themselves um, about uh, who they are, uh, why they're part of the CCC, and um, the work that they have done, and as well, what they would like to see in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Romina, for setting the stage and context for this webinar. We would like, uh, we would like to now turn to Nigeria for their to provide an overview of the actions they've taken to reduce SLCPs. I would like to introduce Asmao Jibril. Thank you very much for joining us, Asmao. She is the scientific officer with the Federal Ministry of Environment, uh, also uh, backed up by Balababa for further support if required during her presentation. I kindly ask that all uh, panelists uh, indicate next to move through the slides since the Secretariat is managing the master slide deck. But um, over to you, Asmao. Welcome to this webinar. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, all. Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to some. So, um, Nigeria uh, joined the CCC in 2012, and of course, for the uh, reason to to reduce the short-lived climate pollutants in the uh, emissions in the country. So um, with that, um, Nigeria revised her uh, NDCs um, 
in 2021, just uh, before the COP26, and uh, we have an unconditional reduction uh, target of 20% below business as usual by 2030. And um, we have a conditional uh, uh, target of 47%, uh, uh, which is uh, subject to international support. Nigeria also added two new sectors, which is uh, waste and water, to the existing five, which are agri agriculture, industry, transport, power, and oil and gas. So uh, the mot motivation for joining the CCAC and tackling the short-lived climate pollutant emissions in Nigeria. Uh, well, we, we had uh, from our national, um, our submission to the UNFCCC on the uh, uh, Nigeria's uh, national um, Nigeria's uh, so uh, our emission our emissions to the to the UNFCCC we had uh, um, uh, energy had this about sixty percent of the uh, emissions in the country and followed by a FOLU then waste than the industry sector. So uh, the major methane emission sources are from energy, that is the oil and gas, and uh, from uh, household energy as well. We also have from the AFOLU and the transport and waste sectors. So the uh, motivation to, to join the CCAC was uh, due to these um, uh, emissions from these various sectors. Next, please. So uh, CCAC supported projects carried out in Nigeria. We, uh, we were supported by the CCAC to develop the National uh, Action Plan to reduce the short-lived climate pollutants, which was uh, endorsed by the Federal Executive Council in Nigeria. And uh, implementation of this uh, National Action Plan has uh, started across the sectors in Nigeria. We have uh, two, 22 mitigation measures across the sectors. And like I said, they are already under implementation, most of them. And then we have the UNDP uh, support uh, to include SLCPs into the revised NDCs. And it was co coordinated by the Stockholm Environment Institute and Ricardo. Other activities to reduce uh, methane in, uh, that were supported by the CCAC was the peer-to-peer -peer capacity building support, uh, capacity building support to the ministries of environment, the petroleum resources, Ministry of Petroleum Resources, and uh, it was implemented also by the CCAP and the CATF. So uh, we also have the CCAC capacity building support to, minister, to the Ministry of Environment the Ministry of Petroleum and uh, other oil and gas stakeholders by the Clean Air Task Force and uh, Carbon Limits Nigeria. Um, some of the policies and measures to support the achievement of the methane targets across uh, different um, across sectors. So under the oil and gas, we have measures to reduce gas flaring and fugitive methane emissions and leakages of uh, uh, methane. Under the AFOLU, we have uh, measures on enteric methane, manure management, deforestation, and af afforestation. Under waste, we have measures on municipal solid and liquid waste management. And under transport, we have measures on uh, adoption of uh, CNG for buses, use of low sulfur diesel and petrol, eliminating of high emitting vehicles. Euro 3 and Euro 4, and uh, model shifts from uh, uh, um, road vehicles to, to train and uh, other means of transport that are less uh, emitted. Next, please. So some of the outcomes of this uh, supported activities, uh, um, engagement with uh, key stakeholders, which are the oil and gas uh, ministry, Ministry of Petroleum Resources, and uh, its departments and uh, its agencies. 
uh, we've conducted several in-country workshops to build capacity among stakeholders in the sector with support from the CATF and uh, the, uh, the country regulators, the defunct uh, Department of Petroleum Resources, which is now the upstream, Nigerian Upstream Regulatory Commission and the um, midstream and downstream regulatory agency and also with Carbon Limits Nigeria. We've uh, de developed a baseline for fugitive methane using the country methane abatement tool, and uh, we've trained stakeholders also on the use of the COMAT. We've uh, developed uh, a guideline on methane emissions reduction, which is currently undergoing review with the uh, upstream and mid midstream and downstream regulatory agencies. Next, please. Next. So, um, the, this, all this resulted in, uh, the inclusion of, uh, 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 a methane target in our revised NDC, which we have a 60% uh, reduction in, uh, fugitive methane emissions by 2031. That is, uh, this is a page from the revised NDC. And um, if you look at the last line where we have the yellow highlights, that is uh, uh, what was put in the revised NDC. Uh, we also have others in here, like um, uh, meeting the Euro 3 and uh, the by limits and the Euro 4 by 2030. Next, please. So we have the next steps and going forward we uh, intend to continue implementation of the, the 22 approved slcp mitigation measures across the different sectors and um, of course the implementation of the revised ndc which has uh, since we submitted the ndc uh, work has been going on with uh, the different sectors and the uh, different stakeholders we need to increase mobilization of funding support for implementation of the SLCP projects. We need to build capacity on technical and technology handling to enhance methane reduction techniques among stake, um, the um, sector stakeholders. And we need to monitor and track journey, the journey towards achieving reduction targets by 2031. That is for the uh, methane emissions as stated in the um, uh, revised NDC. So, uh, thank you. Catalina. Thank you very much, Asao. Thank you for that uh, great presentation and overview of uh, Nigeria's motivations to join the CCAC and that work, the work that has taken course over the past years. So now, um, in the interest of time, we kindly ask the participants to provide your questions through the chat function, and we will get back to those at the end of the session. We would now like to introduce Colombia. John Henry Mello will be representing the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development. He's the technical coordinator of the implementation of Colombia's NDC. Welcome, John. Over to you. Please remember to indicate next so that the secretariat can can move the the presentation slides for you. Thank you. Thank you, Catalina. Can you listen to me? Yes, we hear you well. Oh. Your camera, however, is sideways. I don't know if there's any. Yeah, I, I'm having a mess excellent. with with the with my PC, so I'm trying to uh, to do as best as I can with, with my cell phone, sorry for the inconveniences. Uh, yeah, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for, for helping me with, with the slides. Uh, uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, I want to, to extend uh, 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 my gratitude to the CCAC uh, for all the, the progress the collaboration, the close collaboration that uh, uh, since 10 years from now, uh, it has been uh, uh, 
this collaboration that has been really uh, great uh, for for making real progress in our country and um, this is something that uh, we would uh, that we are very pleased to attend right now to be part of, of, of this commemoration and to share with you some of the progress that Colombia has been doing in terms of the implementation of of the of of, of or the mainstreaming of SLCP considerations with our, our planning processes as well as our uh, our uh, implementation. So um, next slide, please. Okay, perfect. First of all, I would like to 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 show a, a brief scheme about the what has what has been the major milestones of Colombia. I'm going to to go a little bit deeper and uh, uh, very quick, but uh, nevertheless, I would like to first to 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 reiterate that Colombia is part of the founding members of the CCAC and that we have been working on a lot of of projects. Uh, for example, uh, within the SNAP initiative, we have had some major milestones uh, that include the development of our shell deep climate pollutants mitigation strategy, the development of our first black carbon inventory that was uh, done in 2018, uh, and uh, another uh, major milestone that was included with the, within the update process of our NDC that was the inclusion of specific uh, measures uh, in terms of black carbon along with the measures of other SLCPs that were already uh, uh, being taken into account and the inclusion of a specific black carbon reduction goal, a quantitative goal uh, for Colombia that uh, is to reduce uh, our emissions by 2030 by 40% uh, compared with our 2014 emissions level according to our inventory so that that is the first uh the first experience uh that we have had in terms of including black carbon specific mitigation re uh, goals uh we are among uh, perhaps the, the the only three countries until that time that 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 were doing that and uh, and well that that's part uh, and that's a natural result of all the progress that we have been doing uh, and all the capacity building and all the the, the data that we have that uh, in uh, that is uh, in a very important portion thanks to the collaboration that the CCAC has provided to us. One of the our most uh, recent milestones uh, was uh, our is uh, issuing our third uh, uh, bur and making uh, as a part of that uh, bur. Uh, the second, our second black carbon inventory. We updated our inventory. Uh, the the first inventory uh, had data until 2014, and 14. The most recent one has data until 2018. So uh, next slide, please. So just trying to go along the other milestones that we have had uh, on all the collaborations that that we have had in other initiatives. Uh, I would like to, to reiterate our work in terms of the inventories uh, that include uh, also other pollutants, other, uh, other pollu air pollutants, uh, our efforts towards the integration or the mainstreaming of uh, SLCP considerations within our MRV systems. We have, uh, for instance, a, a, an indicator of reduction of emissions that is that that has been stated in our NDC, and we want to make part. Uh, we want to make black carbon uh, uh, an integral part of these uh, reduction monitoring systems that would that would go uh, project by project as they are registered. So we can not only have a, an indication of the reduction of emissions by measuring the total inventory that is a top. Uh, 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 top-down approach, but uh, also to have a a, a methodology to uh, have some uh, information about the reductions project by project, and 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 that's that's one of our of our objectives uh, objectives from now on. Uh, also, as I said, we mainstream it at black carbon with our our NDC. Uh, we have some specific measures of black carbon, five specific measures comprising from uh, emission uh, systems in the diesel fleet to non-road emissions uh, standards, uh, as well as agricultural burning uh, measures and uh, uh, cookstove specific measures. So uh, next slide, please. 
uh, in terms of how we have integrated the narrative of health and air quality and climate change, that is one of the main objectives of the CCAC, we have had progress on several fronts. For example, one of the most recent one was a collaboration that we had with, uh, with the uh, help of the WHO uh, to determine the health benefits of the NDC implementation. At, uh, and it was done through a specialized um, tool that is called Carbon H. It was done uh, uh, also taking into account or taking it as an input the progress that has been made before with the help of the CCAC in terms of assessing co-benefit uh, be, uh, co benefits uh, from the implementation of mitigation measures. Uh, it was done before the, the NDC was established. So, we, we, what we did was updating it with uh, the measures that are stated in our NDC. We have been uh, working from the Ministry of Environment in close collaboration with the Ministry of Health uh, in order to uh, strengthen the sector and promote the use of specialized uh, tools that let them estimate the cost benefit of any measure that is associated with the reduction of emissions of short-lived climate pollutants. So uh, now more than ever, we can say that the health sector is very aware of the narrative of the short-lived climate pollutants that they are right now using these tools and that we are right now continuing to work with them in the definition of specific plans. So, uh, so uh, plans and, and uh, in terms of the NDC uh, to, to also take into account all the hidden costs of having, for example, better um, emission control systems. We have, had, we have been working with subnational stakeholders at the region level, at city level, to uh, provide uh, guides for the estimation of multiple benefits uh, through the uh, implementation of emission mitigation uh, systems in transport, as well as other uh, sources. And as I said, uh, this is all aligned with the specific black carbon measures that we have defined in our NDC. Uh, we have specific measures for black carbon, but also there are several measures that were originally conceived for with the GHG logic that also uh, of course, have a direct impact in terms of black carbon, and we measured that. We measured that. We measured what was the result of, or, or what was the co-benefit in terms of black carbon reduction uh, for the implementation of GHG um, reduction uh, emission uh, measures. Sorry, and that's that. That was part of the input that we had in order to define our goal of reducing 40% of our emissions by 2030 compared to 2014. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of how are we strengthening uh, the capacity to uh, effectively reduce the emissions of SLCPs, what I can say is that uh, we are we have been working in several fronts in terms of, uh, uh, in, for example, with specific cities of the country to reduce uh, the the uh, emissions of of uh, air uh, air pollutants. Um, that we are working with each one of the cities and regions in order to evaluate how the current policies of the, those cities actually contribute to the uh, to the uh, to the to the five black carbon mitigation measures that we have had uh, with, that we defined in our NDC. So we are right now working and mainstreaming it on, uh, to the subnational level, and that has been. Uh, thank you also to the great. Um, support that we have had uh, from uh, the CCC. Next slide, please. And now in terms of replicating successful cases, what I can say is that we have had only not work from the SNAP initiative, but also from uh, other fronts. For example, in terms of the brick kill initiative, we're proud to say that we're among the leaders of those of this initiative in the world that we have uh, uh, that uh, within our country uh, and thanks to the collaboration of the CCC, we have uh, made around 168 measurements that have allowed us to uh, obtain nine customized emission factors according to different technologies and different regions that we have. Uh, I would dare to say that this specific sector is one of the best uh, sectors in terms of the characterization, the level of characterization or the level of detail that we have in terms of emission factors. We have also had experiences of knowledge transfer to colleagues in countries such as Peru, Mexico, India, Bangladesh, Nepal and Pakistan and uh, that we are continuing to work in terms of the creation of working spaces 
for uh, public policy, as well as the generation of guidelines and other documents in a very close collaboration with the brick kiln sector uh, that has been even a very positive experience that we want to replicate to other sectors. The, the way that the brick kiln sector in Colombia is organized, the way that all the entrepreneurs uh, go to do, uh, attend those meetings and are really interested in, in having uh, and learning about better ways to produce uh, is uh, stunning for us and we want really to replicate it to other sectors such as, for example, the coke production and, and others. In terms of the oil and gas uh, initiative, we have had uh, technical contributions to the regulation of fugitive uh, methane emissions in the hydrocarbon sector. And I forgot to add something very important, and it is that, that Colombia is part of the methane pledge. Uh, it was uh, uh, it was done during the COP26, and Colombia is right now assessing uh, alternatives in order to reach the reduction that is stated in the meeting pledge, that is to reduce by 30% the emissions uh, in 2030 compared to the level of emissions in 2020. Uh, we have a baseline, let's say a baseline that is uh, the 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 one that is stated in the NDC, we have um, we have found that uh, the uh, meeting pledge uh, is uh, going to require even more efforts, and we are right now uh, assessing what are the alternatives so we can uh, contribute to the fulfillment of this very important pledge. We are aware that meeting is one of the main. Uh, causes of concern within the world and that many of those measures, uh, in particular the oil and gas sector, as well as the agriculture, the livestock sector, have a huge potential to, uh, to, to go ahead. In terms of the transport initiative, we have had the support of the CALAC Plus program from Swiss Contact, where among others, we have had uh, results uh, in terms of the contribution for the dynamic test emission standards for non road land mobile sources and other kind of contributions in terms of uh, uh, the uh, emission control systems, especially uh, in diesel, especially within the cities. So that, that has been a, a great support from, from Swiss contact. And uh, finally, in terms of uh, the progress that we have been doing in terms of coke stoves and agriculture burning, uh, just say that the CCAC have support had supported us for designing a, a project uh, guide for uh, developers within cities to uh, uh, develop uh, projects of co efficient coke stoves. And right now, the CCAC is helping us uh, to formulate uh, and implement the installation of 10,000 cook, efficient cook stops within the territory, um, as well as to define a quantitative goal for agriculture burning, because the NDC, as it is stated in the NDC, it is stated in a qualitative manner. So we are right now working uh, to uh, to know what is the specific mitiga uh, mitigation measure that we can compromise uh, in terms of uh, agriculture burning phenomena. So that that that's mainly the the progress that we have been doing. There are I, I know that uh, the the time is over, so I I would like just to finalize there and and just to reiterate the deep gratitude from Colombia to the CCAC that we have been working in several fronts and that there are many many things to keep doing right now in terms of uh, going ahead with the cities, going ahead with uh, with other. Uh, stakeholders as the private sector, for example, going ahead in terms of the modeling uh, of uh, co-benefits and uh, as well as each one of the initiatives such as oil and gas, transport and uh, and brick kiln. So thank you very much. Thank you, Johnny. Um, so um, thank you for panelists because they, you keep on their time. Now we have um, a panelist discussion. Uh, so, Philippe Brunet from Switzerland, Jonathan Banks from Cleaner Task Force, and um, Stephen Hammer from the World Bank are going to join us for a panel discussion. Please put all your questions in, uh, in the chat, and uh, Catalina will come back with the questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Romina, and welcome to all of the panelists on, on today's webinar. Um, I would like to begin with Philippe Brunet. Philippe, if you could please um, provide some insights into what are the biggest CCAC action um, or yes, actions over the past 10 years. 
Thank you, Catalina, and uh, hi to to everyone. It's it's a pleasure to be on this uh, on this panel and on this event with with you all, and indeed in an important week as we mark the the ten year anniversary of the of the CCAC, which is indeed a good moment to to take stock of what the CC, CCAC has achieved so far uh, in its first uh, busy decade of work. So on, on, on your question, Catalina, on what's the biggest uh, perhaps action, I think it's difficult to single out just one element. Uh, I'll, I'll highlight a couple, and I think some of the main ones were also mentioned by uh, Romina in her introduction. Definitely the work on the Kigali Amendment uh, was a big one. The CCC's support to uh, the, um, or the CCC's global methane assessment, better said, which uh, laid the foundation for the global methane pledge, I think is another significant achievement. Um, that's certainly worth highlighting, and perhaps just to to dig a little deeper on that, I think the gold methane assessment and other key reports that the CCC has produced on um, at the regional level, such as in in Latin America, but also in um, in Asia, for example, focusing on specific solutions. This is really one of the CCC's big achievements, in in my view, of having been quite successful at putting SLCPs on the global agenda and demonstrating the multiple benefits of integrating climate and clean air action for human health, for food security, ultimately for the sustainable development goals in the 2030 agenda. And these kind of strong evidence base, these groundbreaking reports have been um, have been instrumental in then gathering commitments from from governments and other actors also to to take um, further action on on SLCPs. But perhaps one other aspect that um, I'd like to touch upon in a bit more depth is, in, in my mind, one, one of the biggest achievements from the CCAC. And without it being one of those, um, let's say, flagship reports, but more in the way it works, is that it's managed to build an engaged community of policymakers, practitioners, scientists, working together to accelerate efforts on climate change and air pollution in a focused, pragmatic manner. And this bringing people from across continents, from different perspectives, from governments, from international organizations, from NGOs, and to tackle the, the, the biggest emitting sectors uh, responsible for SLCP emissions. And the way this kind of work comes together, perhaps just to take an example from uh, the transport sector, which has been uh, an area of particular interest to, to us uh, in the CCAC, as well as the BRICS sector, where, we, where we've linked a lot of our uh, country level and regional bilateral cooperation projects with the work of the CCAC. Um, some of which uh, John actually just mentioned from Colombia, Calac Plus on, on transport, and we, we worked on BRICS uh, previously, also, also in Colombia and with other countries of the region. So, on transport, for example, the way the CCAC has come together on tackling this sector, it recognized the imperative and also the huge opportunity that there was to significantly reduce air pollution emissions from heavy duty vehicles with very high immediate benefits, both for human health, but also for reducing black carbon emissions. And that led the CCAC to develop a global sulfur strategy that was endorsed by um, 38 countries, I believe, in 2016, and that really set a roadmap, set the direction of travel for moving towards cleaner fuels and cleaner diesel vehicles. But beyond, or in, it, in addition, let's say, to setting that kind of framework, the CCAC then supported countries with technical assistance to translate that at the national level to move towards improving fuel quality, reducing sulfur concentrations in fuel, for example, and also adopting higher vehicle emission standards. And it did this at the at the national level, but also importantly at the regional level to try to work to, to harmonize norms, for example, in West Africa and Southeast Asia, with some important successes, such as with uh, with ECOWAS in West Africa, adopting common standards in 2020. So this capacity to, to set the global agenda, also to set regional agendas backed up by strong science, and then to find the most effective solutions in key meeting sectors, is in in my view the let's say key strength of the CCAC and and one of the main main um, parts of its value added and its contributions to accelerating action on both the climate front and the air pollution front. Thank you, Philippe, for that insight. Um, I would now like to turn to Jonathan Banks for more of a an NGO perspective from Clean Air Task Force. Uh, Jonathan, could you please tell us what is the role of NGO partners in SLCP mitigation and how the collaboration with CCAC has produced better results for countries? You're on mute, Jonathan. Great. 
the most famous phrase of 2021 and 2022, um, uh, for sure. Um, I'll build a little on Philippe's comments, uh, but um, it, 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 the role of the role of NGOs in in the CCAC goes back to really the founding of the CCAC. It was uh, the the founding uh, came from uh, a combined effort of NGOs and governments to elevate the issue of short-lived climate pollutants on the global stage. And I, I think it's important to reflect back over the last 10 years to see where we were 10 years ago on this and where we are today. And it's quite a monumental um, uh, increase in both action and attention to uh, the issue that we are all working so diligently on. Um, last year truly was just an amazing year to see how governments and NGOs and, and researchers combined to elevate the issue of um, specifically methane pollution last year to to levels that you know were inconceivable 10 years ago um, and I, so I think that's one of the things that's really exciting to see but specifically on the NGO front when you, and and the problem that we're trying to uh, deal with here when you look at um, all that we've achieved over the last 10 years but you look at everything that still has to be done, the task is is giant, um, and the role of NGOs is one to um, to to build off of what scientists and government uh, can do, and to help facilitate uh, a move to action. And typically, NGOs work in several different ways. There's there's the pushing from the outside, pushing governments to to act, and that is a critical element of uh, of moving forward on mitigating short-lived climate pollutants. But there's also another role that um, that NGOs can play, and that is one of helping to facilitate action from uh, a, a more quiet and um, uh, inside uh, direction. And that's one that a number of groups have been playing to uh, around the world to extend the ability of governments to take action, helping to assist with overcoming barriers in in developing policies. You know, something that's been um, piloted um, through the CCAC um, and has accelerated in the last few years is is the notion of of working diligently and closely with governments to I identify the problem of, of short-lived climate pollutants and work towards developing policies in in the um, in the methane space. The CCAC supported um, several NGOs to work with countries to help them first understand um, what the, uh, the methane problem was from oil and gas, and then to begin developing policy solutions towards mitigating that, that have been quite successful with engagements in Colombia and Argentina and Nigeria, um, modeled off of engagements in, in Mexico and other countries. And I think that going forward, um, these kinds of technical policy discussions and engagements will be critical from NGOs so that we can continue to extend the reach of the CCAC to, to achieve what we've all set out as our goals, which are deep mitigation of, of, of short-lived climate pollutants. And I'm sure that I use more than my three minutes, so I will stop there and uh, let others go. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And while we still have the country panelists online, I'd like to raise one question from the chat to Asmao Jibril from Nigeria, which I think her response will also provide a nice segue to then uh, Stephen Hammer's intervention. So we have, uh, Asmao, uh, we have a question from, from Katie Swanson from the US United States Agency for International development and she would like to know uh, could if you could elaborate on what the specific waste management measures uh, that Nigeria is pursuing following a, a, a brief question as well on uh, what measures Nigeria is taking to reduce black carbon over to you as thank you so um, let me start with the black carbon um, Nigeria has been working on uh, clean cooking using uh, the clean cook stoves, um, distribution and um, a distribution to, to the different um, regions in Nigeria. We have the six geopolitical zones in Nigeria where we 
have distributed these uh, clean cook stoves and we're working with the Nigerian Alliance with clean uh, Nigerian Alliance uh, for clean cooking to see that um, uh, we are engaged with the clean uh, cook stoves developers to see that um, these uh, clean cook stoves are uh, the, the standards are there and working with the standards organization of Nigeria to uh, to check uh, how how the quality of these cook stoves are that is um, about the about clean cooking also um, we try to 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 um, encourage uh, the 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 or discourage the use of um, the use of uh, fuel wood by um, uh, uh, alternating it with the use of LPG. We have a program under the vice president's um, office uh, for the use of LPG. So we're introducing LPG to the rural and urban areas for use instead of uh, use uh, the usage of uh, fuel wood. So on waste, we just um, uh, introduced uh, the the waste sector in our NDC. It's a new sector. And um, because it wasn't in the original INDC submitted in 2015 because of um, a lack of data for, for, for the waste sector. So we're just uh, starting now and uh, we're working with uh, the environmental protection boards on uh, the, 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 the solid waste mostly uh, to see that uh, this uh, we, we we do the recycling and uh, circular economy also. So um, that is what we're doing for now. But we're still um, working on how to uh, um, work uh, with uh, other other the waste sector on how to reduce this uh, emissions from the waste, especially from the solid and the liquid waste. So that is where we are for now. But uh, the work continues. Thank you, Thank Asmao. You. Thank you. I would now like to turn to Stephen Hammer from the World Bank. Um, Stephen, if you could please uh, provide some insight on why is it a good investment to invest in these kinds of policy actions, especially for developing countries? Thanks, Carolina. And, you know, thanks to the previous panelists. I think they've all done a really nice job laying out the, the basic value proposition of why the CCAC has, has been so effective um, over the past decade. It really is a matter of, you know, bringing science to the table, engaging key implementation partners, mobilizing resources, and then driving action on the ground. And, you know, that action can take multiple forms in terms of, of both capacity building or knowledge sharing, but also, you know, driving actual investments that are going to implement some of the needed changes. Um, you know, a lot of that is very fundamental to how the bank approaches its development work with, with countries around the world. And, and I think that model of trying to, you know, look at the challenges in country, look at what the policy and institutional environment already looks like, look at what the resource opportunities are, financing resource opportunities are, or the limitations. Um, and then putting a strategy together is how we approach things. And, and I think the examples coming out of Colombia and, and Nigeria speak to, you know, how governments can really take the lead on developing a, a, a strong science-based data-driven, uh, you know, reflective of the current political economy uh, strategy, and then move that forward. And then we come in behind to provide as much support as we can. You know, the, the, the why, why does this make sense? Well, look at why governments are taking these actions. It's for health reasons, it's for cost savings reasons, it's to um, try and figure out, are there opportunities for market creation or market growth um, as a foundation for, for economic opportunity for disadvantaged populations? Um, you know, those are the, the reasons why we do our development support on whatever issue but what we've really seen over the last decade is how things like climate action, whether it's on the mitigation side and linking it specifically to SLCPs or on the adaptation side, you know, it is about the core development challenges that countries have, health, lack of jobs, 
um, uh, you know, all, all of the air pollution and all of the things that, you know, they see as the primary drivers for action. Um, you can also, turns out, you can also get some, some climate benefits. And, and so that's how we've been thinking this through. We have uh, worked with clients. We've created special funds at the bank that focus on gas flaring initiatives. A lot of our solid waste and uh, water treatment, sewage treatment uh, projects around the world are aimed at helping to eliminate some of the emissions that are emerging that have, have very strong localized health consequences. So all of this fits together, and it's why we've been such a strong proponent of supporting climate action in countries. Um, you know, a lot of that is steered through um, our climate change action plan. Uh, we're in the second uh, action plan update uh, right now, 2021 through 2025. One of the core uh, new ideas that we put on the table last year is something called a country climate diagnostic report, a CCDR, which eventually will be de developing in coordination with government every single one of those. And it is to provide a very strong and very clear and very data driven linkage between climate uh, challenges, um, either in terms of mitigation or adaptation, and how that's going to affect the development trajectory of a country. And so things like SLCPs, you know, action on different uh, sources of methane kind of fit very well into that story. And it's one of the reasons why this agenda. And, and I think part of it is driven by the work that CCAC has done, is really moving this higher up on the list, getting the attention of governments, getting the attention of teams within the banks, mobilizing resources, not just at the World Bank, but other MDBs as well, because there are these strong development opportunities or challenges that need to be addressed. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, so I just wanted to bring Colombia back in for a question and then we'll come back to the panelists for some final reflections and remarks. Um, John Melo from, from Colombia. We have a, a question that we received from Ruben Mamani. He is an associate researcher from LFA UMSA and would like to know, did Colombia provide any collaboration to other South American countries regarding SLCP reduction plans. Thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, I, I was answering that via chat, but uh, just to be uh, clear, uh, we have had some experiences such as Collect Plus from Swiss Contact that has a that has a very interesting platform in terms that this project is being implemented in four countries at the same time in Latin America: that is Peru, Mexico, Chile, and Colombia. And uh, through that project, we have had. Uh, many uh, opportunities to exchange information and strengthen our capabilities, especially focusing on how to reduce emissions, uh, for example, from the transport sector and non road vehicles. So that has been a very good platform that I think that even could be replicated to other fronts of interest uh, from the CCAC and, and more than Colombia providing support. It has been more a collaborative uh, uh, platform where all countries learn from each other. We have had other experiences, as, as I mentioned before, in terms of very kilns with Peru, and we have had also some informal exchanges in terms of air quality policies with Ecuador. Uh, but we think that there is a lot of room, of additional room to increase the collaboration among the countries in the, in the region. Thank you very much, John Henry. And finally, I just wanted to go back to the panelists here on, on the stage. I'm bringing up the panelists questions in your chat, but I would like to open it up to Romina uh, and to the others, if you would like to um, provide further remarks to the questions that were raised. Um, yes, thank you, Catalina. Uh, I would like to think a little bit about the future um, as, as we leave this call, you know, what do we want? I mean, we have come so far, but as Jonathan was saying, the task ahead is monumental. Um, to avoid the climate the climate crisis, so um, you know we had record temperatures in the Antarctica in Ar in the Arctic uh, just you know ten days ago, and um, things keep um, overreaching whatever provisions uh, the scientists forecast the, the scientists have have told us. 
So things are accelerating, you know, the climate crisis accelerated, and so our actions should be. So um, a couple of, of accelerators, finance is a key accelerator. So um, a, a question to our partners for the future, I mean, how we're going to work on finance, how we're going to accelerate um, what the World Bank can do, what uh, all the other, or other financial institutions that are partners of the CCC can do. Um, should they have, for example, a specific or a fast track for short life time and pollutants uh, projects? Uh, should they commit a specific percentage of their portfolio um, to invest on short life time and pollutant actions? I mean, these are all questions on how we can uh, accelerate. Um, the other question is how can we better measure what we're doing to also move markets? Uh, for example, should we be thinking about GWP20 as a measure for short-lived thermal pollutants, specifically for, for methane reductions? Uh, would that help shift uh, private mar markets? What will be the economic consequences of better measuring our actions? I think that's another uh, key question. So I, I would like to uh, leave this call uh, with this kind of mindset. You know, what else the coalition can do uh, to, to push further and, and to accelerate the actions that we need at the scale that we need at the ground. Thank you. Thank you to all of them. It has been a, a great webinar. Thank you for the Secretariat for organizing this as well. Thank you, Romina. Are there any, any final thoughts before we close this session? Yes, please, John. Jonathan, thanks. I'll be very brief, um, just building off of uh, Romina's um, uh, statements there. I think um, I, I mentioned that last year was it was truly an amazing year to see how the is this issue um, has has risen in the public's perception. I know um, uh, all of us uh, probably have um, examples of our families saying, hey, I saw something on methane, you know, and, um, you know, if, if your family isn't um, isn't um, sp sitting around the dinner table talking about methane um, after last year, then they'll never talk about methane. But I think one of the things that we um, have to um, have to do uh, this year is as as an or as a as an institution, as CCAC, as the countries, as the the NGOs and all the other um, uh, organizations that are part of this uh, is we have to take last year as a starting point and not an end point, and we have to accelerate the um, the actions to continue the momentum that we have built over um, the last ten years and that, that culminated in last year's exciting um, things. Um, so I encourage all of the countries, all of the NGOs, to um, to take um, last year as a, as a starting point and, and to really push hard to continue that momentum that we saw um, as we go into uh, the next COP, um, it, it will be critical that we see um, uh, continued momentum on all of these fronts so that um, these issues can uh, really start to um, be cemented into policy and action. Thank you, Jonathan. Any final remarks from Stephen Hammer? From yes, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. And and again, I think that uh, Romina really touched on, you know, one of the key challenges: is where do we find the resources to do this and and to at scale and to accelerate the action? And and that is a perennial problem with so many climate issues. Um, you know, the World Bank and a lot of the other MDBs, to be to be honest, have you know, really focused on balancing the commitments in terms of mitigation support versus adaptation support. And, and that has been a very strong message coming out of the COP. That's been a strong message coming out of many of our clients that they're non-contributors in terms of global emissions, but they do have uh, extraordinary adaptation requirements. And so, you know, we're constantly thinking in terms of everything needs to be done on a country-specific basis. And that's why we have the CCDR, which really frames climate in a development con conversation and context. It is why when we break it down into the sectors, maybe they do have a gas flaring issue and we do have resources available for that. Maybe they do have sewage treatment or solid waste management needs, and, and then we deal with it that way. Um, 
But I think one of the, the great things that emerged last year was the creation of the methane hub, you know, the, the methane pledge that really began to galvanize attention, galvanize resources, so that countries can begin to develop their plans. That's when they can then talk to financing institutions. That's when they can talk to private sector uh, partners, you know, maybe grab some of that private sector money that seems to be ready to flow towards these issues internationally. Um, but our, our role is to help facilitate and, and advance these conversations as much as we can. Um, uh, and, and all the MDBs are really, you know, making a very strong commitment to these issues. Thank you, Stephen. And finally, I wanted to give uh, Fiji Bluna from Switzerland the opportunity to also give final remarks before we close out. Thanks a lot, Catalina, and, and thanks to to, to all the other panelists, I share a lot of, of what's been said, and uh, there'd be plenty, plenty more to discuss. But perhaps just uh, reacting on one point you, you mentioned, Stephen, also with uh, with regards to, to the calls for adaptation, just flagging that SLCPs are also interesting from the adaptation perspective. By reducing warming in the in the near term, they can also um, reduce or let's say give us a bit more time for adaptation, which is fundamental for avoiding crossing tipping points for ecosystems and communities to be able to adapt better. So I think that that dimension is also uh, should be front and center. Another key aspect is to demonstrate the, the very real benefits of mitigation action at the local level in terms of avoided um, health impacts, reduced air pollution, benefits of food security, which is still critical, including with recent uh, developments that we have at the moment. So this is this is the approach that we take also at the Swiss Development uh, Corporation Agency in our projects, but it's very much the CCAC approach too with the multiple benefits pathways, demonstrating those benefits, quanti um, quantifying them. That can help change the conversation in terms of mitigation. It's not just about contributing to uh, reducing uh, warming at the global level, but there are also uh, more local immediate benefits, and I think that can change the conversation. And finally, ju just to echo perhaps the, the question that, that came from Ruben in the chat and what John was saying, um, there's... Of course, every every everyone has their context. We all there there's specific um, specificities in each country. Yes, in terms of um, of reducing emissions, finding what works in a given country. But there's also a lot that can be learned from uh, different experiences. There's quite a lot of commonality in, in different sectors on what can work, what doesn't work. It's important to learn from from the successes, but also from the failures. And here, the CCAC really provides a good platform through. Uh, the new hubs that have just been launched. So that's just a call to, to everyone interested to also join the hubs in the sectors that they're interested in that are key sectors for them and to, to get that peer peer to peer exchange um, going on there. So thanks a lot from from my side too for this uh, for this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you once again to all of the panelists for joining today's uh, webinar on country actions to reduce SLCPs and for your valuable contributions. I would like to uh, close this webinar by indicating that this, um, this webinar was a, is, is a prelude to a CCAC 10 year anniversary virtual ministerial event that we will be hosting on the 1st of April. So that's this Friday and everyone here is welcome to join. It will begin at 2 p.m. Paris time and it will mark the 10 year anniversary with a special ministerial meeting that will celebrate the power of the CCAC as a partnership which was highlighted on today's webinar. It will also highlight its new strategy and as well solidify its support to the Global Methane Pledge. So our co-chairs from Ghana and, and the US will be uh, very happy to welcome you on this call. And we do expect to hear from US uh, John Kerry, Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, as well as from the Chief Director of MESTI from Ghana and Inga Anderson, who is a uh, UNEP's executive director, as well as a host of partner um, announcements uh, and, and new announcements to reflect on the uh, past achievements, as well as the road moving forward. So thank you once again, and we look forward to seeing you on Friday's, um, at Friday's ministerial event. Thank you. Day to all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Goodbye.